Yes. One of, I, I think it's interesting that you bring up that, that case. I spent quite a bit of time in Northern California with friends and colleagues of Judy Berry's, and one of the things that you didn't touch on with, is the emotional impact of conspiracy theories on a community and on a community of activists. Or, and the, you know, there are still in, in the town where, in the towns where she lived and the people she worked with, there's so many just difficult feelings and so many people had to drop out of activism altogether or, you know, it totally changed the way that they did stuff. And so part, I mean, not, not to really apologize for conspiracy theorists, but it's kind of the thing that, you know, after this touches your community over and over and over again and you, in that sense of, this can't be real, this can't be happening here. <laughs> you know, I guess, I guess as, as an anarchist community, one of the things that we have very few tools for them is how to heal after, after being in those sorts of situations. And, and it's really unfortunate because we lose a lot of people and we lose to fear and mistrust of each other. And I mean, it, that, that was also a huge part of COINTELPRO was yeah, exactly. turn people against each other and make them fear each other and break down community from the inside. And it's a fantastic tactic and it works. So do you have any reflections on or any, I don't know, anybody can speak to this of, you know, where, where do you go with that, the emotional impact of that kind of stuff? I have lots of reflections on that, but, but um, I've been talking a lot, so. JJ? Yeah, I just wanted to, <clears throat> it seems to me that the distinction you've made is between good and bad theory, ultimately. And you're saying any theory has to develop an institutional analysis at some point. And so that what, what really, I want to talk about other aspects of conspiracy theory from that, that angle. And, and in a lot of ways, all theories start off as conspiracy theories, right? That you, can't, you don't have the proof, it's a thesis. <laughs> this is an idea based on a number of things that I know could be true. Take the Judy Berry case. Um, that you, I, this is probably what happens. Now I have to go out and prove it. But because, as you yourself admit, we don't have access to a lot of this stuff, and it takes a lot of time to figure these patterns out, the truth in a situation, we end up limiting ourselves, and conspiracy theory in some ways becomes a mode of silencing, right? That we can, any time that someone has a new idea, a new analysis that can't quite be proven out, the left especially, and I think this is what Jack was kind of getting at, slaps that down, right? So that's conspiracy theory. We want to avoid that. And so I, I would really like you to sort of think about that, and I'll give a historical example. Take the Reichstag fire. What the Nazi party, <laughs> yeah, what the, what the Nazi party does is say immediately anybody that picks that out is a conspiracy theorist, right? And even the left itself starts to say, yeah, well, maybe we shouldn't. They can't be that, that crazy. They, they wouldn't do that. And so historically we know in this unique case that that was true. But the action against the Nazis and what they were doing was silenced and repressed um, because of this sort of slapping on this label of conspiracy theory. You look like a bit of a kook um, because of that. And I think that we have to look at that sort of reverse, reverse side of conspiracy theory um, and be very careful about making the distinctions um, because that shortcut function, I think, is really important, the emotionality and stuff, to get people to think in new ways, to start to construct new paradigms. So all we're really asking, or it seems to me, all you're asking is that we just do good theory. And I can agree with you on that. But to me, to lump everybody together, right wing, left wing, and all that stuff, misses a fundamental point of developing theory, and especially for anarchists, developing our own theory, when we have very little information, very little historical tradition, we got to make some jumps and, and then back that up. So. Brooke, are you raising your hand or are you just playing your well, hand? I'm, I'm, I think it is a distinction in theory, but it's also how you present your theory. I mean, I think what you're talking about is a sort of coercive nature to presenting information that would, to me, distinguish between a theory that's a hypothesis and a theory that's well-grounded. And I, I, I totally agree that you have to start somewhere. But I think it's how you present that information that, for me, crosses the line into a conspiracy theory versus a hypothesis that may sound very outlandish but has a potential. And you're putting it forth as having a potential of, having, um, a, of being truthful in reality. But you're not necessarily planting that idea in somebody's head in a coercive or underhanded, not entirely honest way. Can I just say something really, really quickly? Just, this is like a, you used the example of uh, results that the people in power, they don't always get them. But I think that this is also what other people were picking up on. In fact, they often do. And the Reichstag fire is, is an example. And so I think that's where it can be a personal cabal. It really can be. 
That, that's what that is. And so I don't want to rule that out, and I think that's what makes a good hypothesis or a bad hypothesis. If I start saying it's the Jewish bankers, we know historically, you know, that just doesn't exist. If I say it's a cabal of people that it actually, it was Hitler and the gang, that starts to have more viability as a hypothesis. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, sorry, I'll be quiet. Yeah, and, and it's also an effect then of, of the fetishized narrative structure uh, outside of its context and then list uh, characteristics um, and then kind of generalize, universalize those. Or if you look at the conspiracy theory community, conspiratology community, as I would call it, because the, and this, this is what they call themselves, right? I mean, and nobody wants to call themselves conspiracy theorists. This is why, you know, Albert and Chomsky are always making distinctions. It's, it's kind of like the term white trash. Nobody really wants to be. It's always somebody else down the road is, is the conspiracy theorist, not us, right? So, uh, but, uh, but if, look, it's, it's an antagonistic community. It, it, you know, it has at least the form of, uh, of scientific scholarship in the sense of people challenge each other on, their, uh, you know, on the presentation of this. So, so even though any particular narrative might have these characters of being sealed and closed, uh, that once it's put into context, and it's always in context, then it, it's always being reworked and challenged and, uh, and repeated that way. But my example, I, I would throw, to, to go back to emotionality, uh, right, is... Um, the debate between uh, Michael Parenti and Chomsky around the, the, the role of conspiracies and conspiracy theories in, uh, in leftist analysis, where you know Parenti says, "Well, okay, it doesn't have to be you know the center of our structural analysis, but let's admit that conspiracies are part of um, you know uh, the way governments operate." And so, what is this? I don't know if he actually says this part, right? But um, at some point, there is this notion of this can happen here, which is what you said, right? This feeling that in the U.S., this is American exceptionalism, right? Assassinations, that's, that's part of the, the Middle Ages. You know, we're a modern society. We don't, we don't traffic in that kind of stuff, right? But, then, but so there ends up being a, a, almost an emotional commitment to a faith in, um, in modern politics, the modern organization of politics, where um, that, uh, those kinds of activities are not part of Western Enlightenment rational uh, government. And, uh, and once one makes that commitment, then, then yeah, then one can start then saying, well, anything that posits something that irrational, like, you know, we would be assassinating potential leaders, then, um, uh, you know, that's sort of off the charts. But, um, but, but again, one doesn't, to go on to the Chomsky thing, one doesn't have to believe in the Camelot myth to, to make a, a case that, you know, the state will execute its own um, uh, when, when it needs to. I mean, regardless of whether one believes that or not, but one, uh, one can make a different argument other than lionizing Kennedy or something along those lines, which Chomsky assumes we have to do. A lot of conspiratorialists around the Kennedy assassination uh, uh, denounced the Camelot myth. They, they hated what they thought Kennedy stood for, um, and they are still convinced, not nevertheless, but because of that, they are convinced that so-and-so and such-and-such was actually behind, you know, that the CIA got rid of Kennedy because he was screwing up their attempt to whatever, and that's a grand thing. And yeah, you're, you're quite right that those two things did not necessarily converge. Brian, you want to jump in? Yeah, the, one of the things this discussion is, is getting me thinking about is how much of the appeal of conspiracy theory comes down to the reality that people tend to think in stories. And that it's just much easier for people to focus on the individual bureaucrat who works for Monsanto, or the individual FBI agent who bombed the car, or how nasty Rumsfeld and Cheney are, than to think about a larger system of, of, of analysis. And th the question that leads me to is, is there a way we can present a more systemic social critique in a way that is as compelling as, as telling a simple story? And it's hard to know how to do that. What if our answer is no, though? Yeah. What if we <laughs> recognize that no? The analysis that we could, the counter, the alternative analysis that we could, in fact, put forward that would be what I was trying to call a structural analysis or whatever you want to call it that's not, cons I think, not conspiratorial. What if that's not nearly as compelling? I, I think in yeah. some cases, it's just not going to be as accessible, uh, as readable, as sexy, as obviously persuasive on first glance as some of the, um, some of the competition, uh, uh, let's say. And that, to my mind, suggests that we, <laughs> we want to commit some resources in our own movements, not all of them, but some resources in, in our own movements, to working harder on the things that I was trying to gently point out have sometimes been missing from the anarchist uh, tradition. Not at all that we should all, um, you know, I don't know, become theorists. Well, we're all, we're all already theorists. But take that aspect of our activity 
more seriously and try to give it a little, a little bit more time and do a lot of really hard engaging with other traditions. I've mentioned a bunch of liberal historians whose politics I have no use for, but whose historical work I nevertheless think it is important for us, for radicals, anarchists and otherwise, to, to grapple with in part because it can help to fill in some of those gaps in our in our own traditions. If, if you even buy the, the really basic analysis that I've been putting forth that um, given a system like capitalism, I didn't, I didn't get to talk specifically about capitalism, but if you believe that there is something specifically about a broad social system like capitalism that tends to, that has a kind of built in inherent dynamic that tends to obscure, its, systematically obscure its own operations and its own sort of underlying structures. There's two directions, you can, you can take that in a conspiratorial direction. Well, it obscures things and the way to, to, to solve the problem is to, is to uh, tear away the veil, tear away the mask and find out what's really going on. The other direction you can take that is the much more sort of patient and unfortunately painstaking and time consuming analysis that says, well, let's look at what those structural determinants are. Let's look at how they have changed historically for that matter, let's look at how historical transformation itself, what are some of the general, I don't know, categories through which we can understand uh, historical transformation. Sometimes they happen, in, in, in 1933, they happen through uh, a, a brand new government that really wants to shore up its power, hiring an anarchist from Amsterdam, who's you know a few bricks shy of a load up here, to set a big building on fire. It does indeed happen that way. There are lots of examples of real life Conspiracies. I shouldn't. I shouldn't do that. Real life conspiracies, not with, not with, uh, not with little fake quotes around them. There are lots of examples of real life conspiracies that that we can uh, pinpoint uh, in history. The difference, I think, is where do you put the decisive emphasis on? I think the decisive em emphasis is going to be on much more long term structural trends. Um, if we're talking about capitalism, we're talking white, white supremacy. If we're talking about heterosexism, whatever whatever system of uh, oppression and domination we we want to look at, and it's going to be much less on the occasional popping up example. And I do think it is occasional popping up example of the Nazis, you know, hiring this guy to set fire to the Reichstag. Every not everything, almost everything else that the Nazis did was not really conspiratorial in that sense. For one thing, it had the enthusiastic support of a large majority of the German population for a chunk for the major, the better part of the, of, the, of the Third Reich. They didn't have to do it, a lot of those things, in secret because they could trust, they, they knew that they had a lot of people behind them. The things that they did do more secretively were the things that precisely fall outside of the normal, so to speak, functioning, if you can imagine a normal functioning of a fascist dictatorship, outside the normal functioning of a fascist dictatorship. And in our case, I am one of those people who does not think that the United States is currently becoming fascist, not right now at least, but in our case, the normal functionings of an authoritarian, conservative, capitalist uh, uh, polity, the normal functionings, I think, are not generally structured along conspiratorial lines. I think most of the time they function because their logic is working the way it should, and it doesn't need a small group behind the scenes to set something in motion in order to, to you know, grease the wheels and keep the, the, the cogs turning at the same time. Yes? And I came in a little late, so I probably shouldn't be talking, but just what about the factor of just human fallibility and all this? Where, you know, a lot of the times in what seems to be conspiracy theory, you know, so much is taken as very deliberate, volitional, and well coordinated. And the fact is, people are human, you know, they make mistakes. They lose sleep, they get hungry, they forget to do something. And when we're talking about a large network of human beings, all with the same, you know, fallibility operating in a large bureaucracy where communication isn't always there, you know, so much of what goes on could be just attributed to just fuck up some lack of communication. Right on. We, 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 we did get to that a, a little earlier in our discussion. Actually, JJ, I thought, had a very interesting response. I was sort of saying something, you said it much more succinctly than I did, but I was trying to say something along the same lines, and I think JJ had a really interesting response, well, that in fact, people in powerful positions sometimes do get their, uh, uh, get their will implemented. They, they are able to achieve their goals, in fact, much more readily in many cases than most of the rest of us who don't have all those, uh, you know, powerful implements at their disposal. And I, I guess I would say that, I think you're right about that, I guess I would say that, um, it is nevertheless the case that even extremely powerful people, let's, let's go back to the Nazi example, let's look at Hitler when he was a very powerful person, they still make lots and lots of mistakes. The fact that the Nazis lost uh, the war, again, is it, 
you know, it's not just because of a series of tactical and strategic errors at the, uh, at the top of the Nazi decision-making hierarchy, but that certainly played a role. Invading Russia was probably a really stupid thing to do, but they thought, Hitler and his generals thought that at the time it was exactly the right thing to do because it, was guaranteed, it would guarantee that they would win on the continent. As it turns out, war is a very, war, historians of war are probably the best historians there are in terms of being extremely aware of contingency because war is one unending story of fuck-ups. War is not a story of great, very rarely a story of great strategies that actually come to fruition in the way that the people who hatched those great strategies thought they would come to fruition. Instead, it's a case of, I can't believe that, you know, it actually rained that day. So, come on, it, it rains all the fucking time. Of course, it's, there's a chance it's going to rain. I can't believe it actually rained that day. So, my great strategy was, uh, war is just one more extreme example of how frequently people with a lot of power and a lot of ability to implement their own decisions and get their own goals accomplished, nevertheless run into unexpected, what I was trying to call contingent factors that aren't under their own direct control, and for that matter, aren't under anybody's direct control. Nobody makes the winter be especially, no person, no human institution makes the winter be especially harsh around Stalingrad in November 1943. Yes? But, but I think, and I want to push this, uh, partially as a devil's advocate, because to me, you've just told a story that, it, at least uh, historically, I think is very debatable. And what you've started, I think, to, to really push it is, you've got your own conspiracy theory, which is, which is that people, uh, it's not people that do things, it's institutions. And these institutions, conspiratorially, in their own logic, start to work themselves out. Let's just look at the Nazi example. Hitler never had a majority. His vote was decreasing. He, the, the population was terrorized into uh, various versions of support, as happens right across the world in all kinds of various dictatorships. There was particular interests that the Nazi party served. There was little cabals that worked their way out, et cetera, et cetera. Like, and without, if we just recede into this institutional analysis of the type that you're talking about, all sort of it's the night where everything is gray, right? That it's just like, it's just this big process and that let's sit back and take the more, the second example of like America now, is it going fascist or not? It's not, you say. I think, well, we need to look at what fascism is. And unless we start to look at fascism as coming out of a cabal kind of thing, a particular series of interests and contingency affects that and stuff, you miss that. And I think uh, Jack had the, the American exceptionalism thing, right? That we start to say, well, because these forces are so great and individuals don't have this role, we're kind of safe because these conspiracies don't exist. And at the same time, these little cabals are working and there's all kinds of them that are happening and competing with each other and we need to do that kind of analysis. But I think that by, this is like hammering the gophers at the fair, you know, that game where you hit these things down, you're, you're walking down all these gophers and that doesn't allow a sort of a, 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 a critical uh, analysis of what's happening, that these groups of people do get together, that the, the Bush administration's heavily involved in Halliburton or the G thing does matter. I'm not saying it's total and they get everything that they want, but that isn't actually an important fact and we need to make an analysis of it, so. So, I was sort of going off what you were saying and I was thinking about the point you were making where if we just put Donald Rumfield and George Bush on a plane and ship them out, then that would take care of the problem. And I think a lot of conspiracy theories sometimes go a little bit deeper than that, whether it's with Skull and Bones or the Illuminati or the Freemasons, and that they see these social networks that are actually running the show, and that it's not just one or two people running the show, but these grand networks, which sort of comes down to a lot of the way, a lot of class analysis, that there's an elite running the show, and then there's that us that are getting screwed over by it. And so these conspiracy theories have somewhat of a systemic analysis, whether it's good or not is questionable, but do you see any use in trying to, any use in, the systemic analysis of conspiracy theories to sort of be able to give a sexy story or a palatable story to people for the use of radical politics. Do I? I'm the wrong guy to ask, but um, <laughs> uh, not much. I, I can see it being sexy and successful and misleading and wrong. Um, I think you, you, are, you are totally right, and I screwed up by not mentioning this. You are quite right about many conspiracy possibly the majority of conspiracy theories do not just focus on the particular actors, but they focus on the social networks, as you put it, the skull and bones, uh, that sort of thing. And that, in fact, is an even bigger part of the problem, which I failed to reflect in, in my critique. I don't see that as analogous to class analysis. I see that as sort of the contrary of, of what I think of the sort of good, uh, good class uh, analysis. That sort of social network analysis, looking at um, these semi-secret 
brotherhoods and, and, and societies, for example. Um, boy, to, the, the simple ways, simplest way to put it is to say that I think that entirely misses the point of the functions of, of groups like that. There are actual functions that things like the Masons or I don't know, the Elks Club, or sorry, I don't mean to trivialize it, but, but other, other, other um, private associations of those sorts. There are functions that they fulfill, and we can, in fact, sometimes, in some, you know, at some points in history, we can, we can trace the incredible extent of the overlap of the membership in some of those private associations, and the folks who just happen to be, I don't know, on the Supreme Court, or in the administration, or in the Senate, or in the Congress, or something like that. But, if you did that with class analysis, all you would be saying is that, yeah, rich folks run the country. Well, of course they run the country. That's, that, doesn't, that doesn't get us any further in, in our analysis. It's, it's, it ends up chasing its own, uh, its own tail. Bad people who get into positions of power and who want to pursue bad ends, what we think of as bad ends, are sometimes going to choose less public, less obvious, less overt ways of, of getting those things done. That's to my mind, that is neither evidence for or against a generally conspiratorial uh, uh, approach to the world. It's just a, an obvious fact about a society like ours. If we want to figure out why that continues to happen over and over again, then we have to make tough decisions. We have to make a decision between, uh, when, when JJ says, this is maybe too specific, but when, when JJ says that you want to look at a kind of a cabal version of the coming of fascist parties to power, is that, a, is that a fair characterization of the... I don't want to only look at it that way, but, but you want I think it provides something to fair the enough. analysis. I think you, you were dead on in characterizing my own uh, position, which gives very little credence to the cabal theory of how fascist parties come to power. I guess I wouldn't say that we should ignore them and dismiss them out of hand, but when we do look at how fascism actually attains its, its, uh, establishes itself successfully in a particular society, in my question, it's not American exceptionalism. It wasn't the case in Germany or in Italy that, that fascist parties came to power, particularly through uh, cabals and stuff like that. I see, I see George Bush's administration right now, to draw out the historical analogy a little, bit, a little bit further, to be much more similar to the kinds of parties that were trying to run Weimar Germany in the last two years before uh, the, the utter collapse. Not at all the people, they, those folks did not want Hitler to come to power. They wanted to run the country themselves. Hitler was the alternative to those sort of authoritarian, conservative, right-wing folks uh, uh, running the country. And again, we'd have to get in way too much detail, but you're quite right that it does eventually force us to come down on one side or the other of extremely contentious historical debates. There are lots of historians, very good historians of Nazi Germany who are much better historians than I am, who disagree with the analysis that I just said and who would more agree with, uh, with JJ's analysis. Eventually anarchists, not that we all have to become German historians, but eventually anarchists are gonna have to, that would be great if we all did. Ian and I would feel much more, <laughs> much more at home. Um, but we do eventually have to sort of stake out a position on thorny theoretical and historical issues like that and then see where it leads us in, in, the, in the particular social circumstances that we are in. And half the time we're gonna be completely wrong. I'm wrong more than half the time. Maybe 80% of the time we're gonna be completely wrong, but I want us to pay more attention to what theoretical, what conceptual strings are attached when we invoke theory A versus theory B. And at that level, I think I would disagree with the notion that I've sort of been hearing from, from a couple of the folks over here that the anti-conspiracy theory critique is sort of just a meta version of the conspiracy theory that it, that it critiques. I think I disagree to the extent that what I have been calling con a conspiratorial mindset does in fact come with some strings attached. It comes with what I think are these you know, patterns and, and presuppositions, presupp et cetera, et cetera. And I want us to reject those specific patterns and reject those specific presuppositions and instead work toward others. And I'm not in the business of telling you in, in detail what the others ought to be. Uh, yeah, when we just come, come forward, go ahead. So, there's a tension there, because on one level you say, okay, well, uh, analysis of Nazi Germany can have different inflections. We can look at the cabal theory or this, which takes it as another, uh, you know, research framework that, w that we, can, we can have a dialogue about. On the other hand, I mean, there's a wholesale then dismissal of things called conspiracy theories um, by even, like, invoking their, their psychological motivations, right? I mean, how often do we ask about the psychoanalytic motivations of what we do, right? So, or what the attachment to rationality is, these sorts of things, right? It's always uh, reason asking um, uh, uh, its other to, to speak a symptom or something along those lines, right? So, um, 
so, and there's a whole history of turning po political claims into psychological symptoms that, that exists in, in, in the West in the 20th century social science. And so, uh, so there are times where it seems like, okay, yeah, we can have dialogue with these things called conspiracy. But other times it's like, well, no, because they have these symptoms and this is what they do and this is what they're motivated by and these are their threads and therefore there can be no um, discussion, right? That, that's a separate uh, issue. So, so it, it becomes tricky. But then... When do you face one? That's the whole thing. Conspiracy theories are rarely uh, addressed at the level of their evidence, right? These things, because we, we, if we call it conspiracy theory, we already have taken it out of the game of uh, truth and falsity. It's no longer part of uh, verifiability or not. It's about well, it doesn't even belong in our game anymore. So, um, so that's it, it's always a tricky game to play with the term conspiracy theory because it, it because sometimes again, you you seem to want to say well. It's, it's a different way of doing history that maybe we can think about uh, in addition to these other ways, but sometimes you want to say no, right, as well. But it's a, that's, that's a tricky moment. Can we talk about emails around that line all, all day? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I was trained in the Brodellian school of historians in which events don't even really count at all. Or just a phone on the surface. <laughs> that's, that's right, the long delay. And, uh, and, and just personally, you know, it's, it's not particularly interesting to figure out why bad people do bad things. It's much more fruitful to try to figure out why good people do bad things with the best of intentions. But, you know, I, I can see, especially as this conversation has gone on, that there's, there's a kind of conspiracy phobia that, that, that enters in, you know, if you, you think about the Iraq War and the Project for New American Century, um, there's certainly a strong element of, of deliberate plan there, because after all, there is no structural reason for the United States to invade Iraq. Um, and then when you think about the influence of Leo Strauss, mm -hmm. And you see that one of the things that Strauss argues is that the only thing that preserves the virtue of a nation, this is sort of a Heideggerian sense of, you know, we sort of have to be pushed into the confrontation with the ultimate, you know, and that, that only really in the state of war can we achieve authenticity. And, um, you know, it, I find myself suppressing the thought that, well, maybe Paul Wolfowitz and those other people didn't give a fuck if we were gonna succeed in Iraq or not. They really did just want to embroil us in endless war because they wanted to pull the United States to a place where this Straussian sort of virtue could emerge. And, and you know, I have to say, I look at that and I think, boy, that sounds like a conspiracy. But you know, just because of that, it isn't necessarily false. So, um, I guess when I, pose the question in the beginning, it seems like the direction that is taking with a lot of other people is maybe something that I, I do agree with, but it wasn't exactly what I was trying, I don't think I was trying to get at. What, the reason I brought it up, um, compared conspiracy theories to rather these sort of grander theoretical narratives that we are more well, institutional um, theory, as you call it, um, <laughs> is that I wanted to de-emphasize certainty in theoretical discourse. I think it's really important to let go of that sort of dogmatism. Um, the, one of the values of conspiracy theory, I think, that you began to talk about but didn't go into as much, is that having this information out there that seems preposterous to us or seems preposterous to our regular rational minds brings into question the idea of knowledge and information a at its most basic level. I mean, it's like information jamming. It's so much out there that we begin to think, okay, well, you know, perhaps all our assumptions have been false all along. And I think it's really important to say that, I mean, we as anarchists are very often saying, like, you know, a lot of us are atheists, and it's easy for us to say to somebody, you know, well, we don't, we, there's nothing, you know, there's no God, there's nothing, et cetera. What is very, the, the analog, the analogy I'm making is that it's very difficult for us to accept that there are no cultural motivators at all. And the only way that, that a cultural motivator arrives is, um, we were actually talking about this at lunch a little bit, there's a quote that says, faith is the choice of the most meaningful hypothesis. And I think that 
when it comes down to theory it's the same thing it's we're choosing the things that are meaningful to us rather than i mean it just seems to me as if there really is nothing and the important part is finding the one that is functional for yourself and i didn't realize that's so like pomo it's painful but i do think that like i, I mean I, I, <laughs> but i i mean i, I just think that it, it's i just wanted to you know de-emphasize that that we are, you know, so certain of ourselves when we come up with things that are institutional, um, that are institutional narratives, uh, and that's what they are. They're not just theories; they're narratives. So, I don't think that's. I, I think you. I think the three of you are are, are really right about my uh, position. I think I still think there's good reasons to to prefer that position. Uh, over this, the, the more open position toward conspiracism that I'm, that I'm, that I'm hearing from, from this side of the room, which I'm sure is shared by other people on the other side of the room. Um, I think that that sort of certainty in an institutional analysis is not necessarily misplaced, although maybe we mean different things by certainty. I think there's nothing wrong with putting forth a very strong version of an argument, putting it out in public and seeing what happens to it, and then when it, parts of it get dis disproved, then the sensible thing to do is just revise your own take on the argument. Um, but being very certain about your convictions is not necessarily a, you know, a, a, a terrible thing. I also, think that, I also think you are right about my um, somewhat psychologizing the, uh, treating as symptoms the specific uh, political positions that are put forth by the, by the folks that I'm critiquing here, and that it's definitely true, but I, I sort of think that's a good thing and not a bad thing, and I think they ought, I think you all, everybody ought to be doing that to, my, to the position I've been putting forth uh, uh, as well. We should be more inclined to apply psychoanal psychoanalytic categories to our own theorizing that rather than, than less inclined. I don't think that sort of symptomology is nearly as bad a thing as some of, I don't know, as Zizek, for example, thinks it is. I, I, think, it's, I think it's a good thing in, in, in many cases, um, not a bad thing. And I am, in fact, arguing for not exactly a phobia toward, I, I hope I'm not arguing for a phobia toward conspiracy theories. I, I would like us, phobia to my mind uh, suggests staying away from, and I am thinking more of a, uh, like a philia towards, uh, moving towards conspiracy theories, getting our hands on them, but at the same time remaining very skeptical, not just about the specific evidentiary bases. I, I, maybe, I made a difficult decision when I conceived this workshop to sort of try to stay away from looking in detail at specific conspiracy theories. I wanted to step away from the let's refute or acknowledge the truth of specific instances, and instead I did my whole abstracting thing, which has a lot of its own weaknesses. But I want us to have a basically skeptical attitude towards the, the general way of looking at the world that I think we can see reflected in many different varieties of uh, conspiracist thinking. Not because it might, um, I don't know, not because it might sort of uh, seep into our own discourse and therefore make it impure, but because I think it distracts us away from what, what I am thinking of as, um, I don't know, just the, the, the preferred, my preferred version of, of uh, of social critique, which I think is based on different, a different set of theoretical presuppositions and a different set of conceptual patterns. Yes? In a phobia I mean, he also has a thing that narcissism of small differences, right? So the closer you are to something, the more you want to, it, it, yeah, you want to have to make, yeah, distinctions, strong distinctions. So I think that's part of it too, and this is part of what we're talking about. Like, what is the difference? You know, what is, so, so this, this, this need to discriminate and, and make these cuts in the world are part of the, the, that. And so the, the question though is, does one want to do that out of fear and anxiety over what conspiracy theories might do to the left, or are there other ways of making these distinctions um, that, uh, that, that might be more productive? Sure, that's a, good, that's a good line of thinking to pursue. I don't have ideas on that line, but I like that way of framing it. So making a strong argument, you talk about you know, making a strong public argument about these. I mean, can it be done with the people we're calling conspiracy theorists? I mean, can you make that argument to them and, and set up uh, ways of, uh, if not dialogue, at least some kind of exchange, which, uh, it, it, yeah. I hope so. I, I have failed every time I've tried to do that, but I'm a polemical guy, so, um, I'm probably the wrong person to be attempting that dialogue, but I do, have, I do hope that that dialogue is possible. I have a number of very solid anarchist comrades who, who I respect completely and who I think are much more willing to, to buy a lot of the conspiracist analysis that I've sort of critiqued here uh, than I am. And with, with them, I've just mostly avoided the topic so far. I don't know, cause maybe because my experience with real dyed-in-the-wool conspiracists has been 
a failure every single time. But I do think it would be better, I should overcome those personal inhibitions, it would be better if those of us who, who, who are generally skeptical towards conspiracism would engage with our comrades who are more welcoming toward it, and maybe it'll change, you know, maybe it'll change our own minds as much as it might change their mind. I don't know. Yes, JJ. Just quickly, it's not that, I just want to be clear, it's not that I'm a huge fan of conspiracy theory. Sure. I just think the framework you laid out obscures a lot of really important differences within it. And at the same time, I was just thinking, you know, why do you pick up a book and say, this is a liberal historian? It's good stuff, though. But this is a conspiracy theory, and therefore, yeah, don't, there can't be anything in that that might be useful. What's and the because what you're making a distinction of what's good and bad knowledge, right? And the conspiracy theory, construct, you construct it in this way that from the right-wing anti-Semite to the uh, anti-Nazi cabal theory person are all lumped into this huge thing. Uh, because there's something there that uh, is dangerous. And what, what I'm saying is what all you've done is to identify good and bad theory as far as I can see it. But then at the same time, there is acceptable bad theory that we can look at, like liberal oh, like theory. Liberal like the liberal historian. Okay. So that, that then you are making distinctions, but within your framework, all I'm saying is, is that your framework doesn't actually address those. Yeah, yeah you're totally right. I guess if I was, if, if I was addressing it, a Congress of liberal historians, maybe I would, I would plea for, if I had Richard Hofstadter or Norman Cohen in my living room, which is an impossibility at this point, but let's say I, I had, I think I would be arguing more or less what I argue today with the emphases reversed. Instead of spending 90% of my time drawing up what I thought were the really negative parts of conspiracy theory, I would try to convince them that, well, I think you guys are right about the structural parts of conspiracy theory, but you are wrong to extrapolate that onto radical politics as such, which is essentially what, what both Cohn and, and, and Hofstetter did. And then, but I suppose the way to actually anchor that sort of position is to try to show a well-developed alternative non-conspiratorial version of radical politics that, again, not out of, I, I think not out of, fear, I hope not out of fear or phobia, but out of a set of decisions about what is good theory, what is good knowledge, and what is bad theory, and what is bad knowledge, has chosen, this other radical position, has chosen to eschew largely conspiratorial frameworks and instead put in place of them, I don't know what to call the thing anymore, structure analysis or institutional analysis or, or something like that. That's not going to convince Norman Cohn and, and, and Richard Hofstetter, but it might convince other folks who are out there in the general milieu around us who are not yet anarchists. Um, but who are drawn to a more radical version of social analysis, but who are a little bit put off by what they see as the kooky conspiracy theories that so often come out of our milieu. Yes, Brooke. What you're talking about is a little over my head. But what I'm, I mean, and I think that's part of it. I think that when you're dealing with even bad theory, but looking at sort of more generalizable um, theories about society, you can use your own experience and I can use my own understanding and my own theoretical um, history to make judgments about what I'm reading versus a conspiracy theory which is really relying on facts of particulars, even a, a con conspiracy theor theory that's laid out in a responsible way, it, I'm still relying on other people's facts and it's way more difficult for me to look at the verity of, of whether there's truth in them or not. And I think that that's why, that's why they can be a lot more dangerous than I would say, you know, when you're talking about sort of linchpin theories. I might not agree with them, but at least I can apply some of my own understanding and my own thinking to um, debunking them or to accepting them, whereas these, it's much more difficult. But it's the use of the term is, like take uh, E.P. Thompson's work. Some people call that conspiratorial history, right? Now, years on, we look at, those of you who know E.P. Thompson, say this is a seminal work, right? And I'm trying to get at what he, what I think his use of conspiracy is, is to, to use that stupid expression of the gophers, right? You just keep banging down this theory, so anybody that's got a new idea that's coming out, so it's like, well, that doesn't make sense. That's conspiratorial. We'll reject it. But these grand discourses that have been around for a long time, like liberal history, well, it's established. I can, I can deal with this and, and not realize what, what it's carrying with us. And that's why the distinctions that he's making, I really think, need to be good and bad, bad theory. And I'm using those terms very, like, I don't know that you can just lay, lay out these things. But that we're, we're trying to say, it, does it uh, fall into acceptable uh, means of proof and that kind of stuff? Um, 
But I, I think we really need to think about the political purposes that, like, we are considered by that outside world as conspiracy theorists, right? And that's used to knock us down. And why are we doing that to you know, other people without just saying, let's look at the validity of the argument. Let's see if it can work out. And maybe it's a really interesting idea, so let's work on that, which is sort of what this conference is. Anarchism doesn't have enough theoretical background. Let's work it out. Let's change it from conspiracy theory in a, in a certain sense, to a good theory in another particular sense. We always, when we, we read theory, do we want to just reaffirm an experience that we have um, and you know, sort of recognize ourselves in something that we read? Or do we read things to do the dangerous business of losing ourselves, right? And, and potentially um, uh, opening ourselves to something new, which is a very risky business. And this is exactly, I think, what you're pointing out. And sometimes when conspiracy theories have this function, they can precisely be that dangerous side of that risk. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't want to also, you know, always you know, uh, close myself off to those possibilities too uh, with that. But, it, but it, there, are no, there are no guardrails, right? There are no sort of guidelines on how to do that. We have a couple of people. I want to let people who haven't spoken yet go yeah, first, and then we'll come back to, to you all. Uh, well, I was just going to say um, about the difference between good and bad theory a bit. I mean, it does seem conspiracy theories, like you talked about, points of innuendo, and like there are a lot of things that, in 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 a lot of conspiracy theories, that. that you're, you're getting the, audio, the person to assume certain things without actually saying you're doing that, which seems to me like it's just pretty bad practice, and, and really that shouldn't be done in any theory. Are there other folks who haven't spoken yet who want to jump in? Go ahead. Yeah, I was, uh, let me think out loud a little bit. There was a movie came out with Michael Caine called The Quiet American, and the first part of the movie, there's this terrorist bombing goes off, and the CIA agent blew up these innocent civilians and they blamed them on the Communist Party. It was an actual incident that really happened. And they called it the um, a black flag operation where the where uh, uh, intelligence uh, state security organizations would cause terrorist acts as a way to discredit your opponent. And uh, and I, I'm, I'm trying to think through this is some conspiracy theories, I have to watch myself because I get really paranoid, you know, but I mean, like, especially in 9-11, I said that there's no way 19 people did this on their own. There must be some state security organization somewhere involved in doing all this stuff, you know. There's just too many balls that dropped along that way, but, uh, but anyway, so I, I, I have to watch my thinking, ah, John, you're getting paranoid, this, that, that. but some of it, when I believe some of the conspiracy theories, there are evil people or people with power that had evil ends that overthrew the government in Chile, that overthrew the government in Guatemala, that overthrew them in 54, overthrew the government in Iran in 54, that, that have, con in, in, I look at state security organizations is m most of what they do is disinformation, not just in, quote intelligence gathering, but putting a bunch of garbage information to cloud up the thinking, you know, in terms of the media, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, I don't know. I understand your point. I, you know, you need to do more structural analysis, and people here are probably more versed in that than me. But, but, uh, uh, but, but, but I, I, some of the conspiracy theories, it, it makes me question every damn thing my government does, and that's healthy. <laughs> you know, yeah, like I'm totally cynical. Like whatever they say in the media, I say, it's all bullshit, it's all lies, you know? So I don't know, I, I, so some of the conspiracy theories I believe say, like, well, it's maybe a little paranoid, but in a way, it has a healthy end, you know? It makes me question state power, and that's an anarchist position, right? <laughs> I mean, does that make sense, or am I like, totally off the wall? <laughs> that's quite well put. I you know? <laughs> I, I, tr I tried to very briefly a account for that positive aspect of the beginning and then, <laughs> and, then, and then went off on my rant. But I think you got a good point. Yeah. Yes, Arthur. But I think the problem is, is that most conspiracy theory doesn't end us up in that position. It doesn't end us up in this, oh, we're questioning state power. It ends us up with black helicopters in the UN yeah, and yeah. the Jewish bankers and yada, yada, yada. And the problem is with, with, uh, with what JJ, which I, I think you're right, we need to be charitable and be able to engage with ideas that are compelling and that have interesting historical facts. The reality is, is that rarely are we going to find ourselves lost in conspiracy. Le rarely is the theory or the scholarship good enough to actually do that. It, it always exists on this very superficial level, connecting different kinds of ideas. I mean, if, if, the, if the theory is good enough to find ourselves lost in it, and, and then we should, absolutely. If it makes us rethink how we understand the world. But the reality is, it, to go with the example of uh, Michael Moore's 9-11, because probably most people in the room have seen it, and it's been a fairly uh, influential film, at least in, in the U.S., is that 
the scholarship is just frankly not there. And the, the really good example that you give uh, of, you know, okay, so Saudis own 13% of, you know, of the U.S. economy. Well, in the 1980s, Japan owned something like 20%, and France, Germany, and Britain owned something like 30%. So where were the German bankers, and where were the Japanese bankers? You know, that, those, those inabilities to connect the, the very real uh, structural issues that do exist, you know, fails to put us in this place of losing ourselves in the theory. And that, if conspiracy theory is good enough and compelling enough, well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, why not explore it and use it and engage it? Um, and then it's not conspiracy theory, I think, anymore. I think it's made a leap to actually being something that's engaged with the very kinds of structures that we use to understand the world around us. I mean, in the, in the example you give, I mean, it's in, in political theory, there's sort of three classic levels of analysis. You analyze how individual actors act, you analyze how you know, uh, bureaucratic institutions act, and you a analyze a systems level, a nation state level. And, and what's happening there is a failure, it's a jumping level. It's like, oh, the Saudis own 13% of America, so therefore George Bush must be doing the Saudi will. I mean, it's a jumping a level of analysis that you can't make. You can't make that leap, at least in classic political theory, and, and that, that should probably be rejected in and of itself. But, uh, <laughs> but, but I, 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 just, I'm, I, I think we have to be able to figure out, well, where are the interesting ideas? Where, is, where are people who are trying to connect different kinds of, of historical events and rewrite historical narratives in ways that are both compelling and interesting that actually m begin to make the world more intelligible in ways that are helpful for us and then don't lead us down the, the track of the black hel helicopters in the UN. Because for the most part, at least in this country, I, I think there's been a shift in recent times, but the, the dominant forms of conspiracy theory tend to be right wing. I mean, we have the militia groups, we have the anti-UN groups, and, and so for people on the left who may have some very good reasons to engage with conspiracy theory, for some, particularly for the reasons that you've brought up, I mean, yeah, they're, they're there, but where, are the, where does the rest of the ideas go? And we have to be able to differentiate those out. Otherwise, I, I don't know what of what use it is to us at all. But of course, though, I mean, I just sort of feel like the, how, however persuasive you think that the argument is depends on how willing you are to be persuaded. I mean, I don't think that there, I, I just wonder why, I just don't understand where you're making this distinction between like our belief and how persuasive the argument is. I mean, if you look at David Icke, like the, Garen conspiracy theorist, you guys all know who he is. He believes that the that Bill Clinton and all the all the huge public officials are, um, I think the word is Saurians or something, these aliens, right? These reptiles. You guys have all probably seen V when you were younger, right? It's like the same thing. Um, but, you know, I mean, there are people who believe him, but the reason we reject that is our unwillingness to be persuaded by this idea of, you know, aliens taking over. But I, I sort of feel like I mean, da I, David Icke really believes this shit, you know? I mean, he's, he's, I don't think that it's, I don't think that it's, you know, bullshit for him. I think that he really believes this is going on, as do a lot of people who found these conspiracy theories. It's not, and I sort of feel like you're taking this tack, like the person, just because the argument is not necessarily airtight for you, that the, that the person who's presenting it doesn't really have any conclusions or hasn't done like, you know, had done any theoretical work or persuaded themselves in a sense. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not, I, maybe I feel like I'm being misread, I'm sorry if I just responded no, no. quickly, but I, I mean, I think we need to be able to say that there, there, are, there are standards of scholarship and, and understanding, and we have to be able to analyze ideas in those ways, and if we don't, if we don't engage on those lines, I mean, I mean, anyone can put out any ideas, and I, I, I mean, I just am not really interested in exploring, like, the idea that well, someone's an right, alien. Right, but, that's, but, but that's, that's where it stops, where you say, I'm not interested in exploring this. It's the same exclusivity that the people who are the conspiracy theorists are espousing for their theories, which you are against, which we're saying that the people who come up with conspiracy theories are opposed to allowing anybody else their explanation, and that's a really damaging effect of conspiracy theories. But it's also what he's saying, which is that, you know, well, yes, but you're also making the distinction as to what is allowed into public discourse simply by saying, I'm not interested in exploring it. That's Andre, a, Andre, if, there's if somebody actually someone over here scale. who's been trying to talk for a while. Can we give this fellow a chance to, sure. to jump in? I'm sorry. I think, I think the term itself has a lot of problems inherent in it because I think the term like conspiracy theory is very ambiguous and it's very relative. Like the pointing out that like walking, ask somebody walking down the main street of whatever major city and they would consider anarchism 
to be a conspiracy theory. So I think that the term itself can be just kind of blanketly applied to a lot of things without without really thinking a whole lot about it. I think that you can you can take specific instances like the burning of the Reichstag, which at the time, if you would have walked around the 30s and said, you know, you know, the you know the Nazi party specifically burned this building for this purpose, like people, well, that's just a conspiracy. You're just making this shit up. But now, in the light of history, like I don't think that 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 event contradicts like an anarchist critique of fascism. I think that that plays into it. Like we can walk in the room over there, or any info shop, or any radical bookstore in the country, and find a ton of information about um, how the media lies to people and how it, it fits in with the power structures that that go into the larger like structural critiques of society that there are, you know, that's a hierarchy. There's a smaller number of people at the top making decisions and a larger people at the bottom being led by those decisions, not having any influence over that. So I think that a natural, like, result of that is you have incidences like, you know, all these histories that we know now because of declassified documents because of other things of governments that have been overthrown that the CIA very clearly was involved in. And, and at this point, it isn't conspiracy theory anymore. It's kind of, it's maybe, yeah, it's maybe, it's maybe radical politics because it's not ingrained into an American history classes in high school. Um, so I think it's important to try and, like, make those distinctions between, you know, in the 70s, it would have been a conspiracy theory to say the Gulf of Tonkin incident never happened. Like, they, you know, people are sitting around the Pentagon saying, shit's going wrong in Southeast Asia, we need to do something, right? But then, you know, 30 years later, Robert, Robert McNamara is like, uh, yeah, we, we just made it up. It didn't really happen. Um, so I think it's important to, to realize that it's a really ambiguous term. And so that you can just say, you know, the official government story of what happened at the Pentagon in 9-11 doesn't match with what I think happened. And then to just... You, you, you can use that and not necessarily extrapolate that into being a larger structural critique, but that, that stuff can like, add to the, like, the, the power structures that we think are in place, the way that there are these people who, you know, who are on the top of this power structure who are able to make these decisions. That a lot of ways it's just the light of time and the light of history that change it from being a conspiracy theory to being radical politics or to being, you know, in a lot of ways, fact. So I think, I think it's the term itself has a lot of is a very loaded term and can be... Isn't that kind of what you were getting at, JJ, with the... I still think I disagree with that. I think that... <laughs> I, I think that... I think I only want to hammer... <laughs> <laughs> no, it's... I'm, I'm, I'm really... I, I can be really obtuse with stuff like this, I admit, and it took a long time for what you were saying to light the light bulb, but I think I just want to hammer some of the hamsters... What are the hamsters? <laughs> gophers. <laughs> gophers down. <laughs> <laughs> Badgers. Not, not all of them. I, I think we can specify, and you might disagree with the specification, but I think we can specify a couple of um, uh, features that what I was trying to call conspiracy theory uh, display. And you could look at, I don't know, Gulf of Tonkin or JFK or whatever you want, you can look at various different explanations that have been put forward for evidently for surface, surface level mysterious events, JFK, some of them will fall into that description of conspiracy theory, depending on what the features were that you picked out that said this is what conspiracy theory is about. <laughs> but some of them won't. Oliver Stone's film will, to my mind, will clearly fall into the conspiracy uh, theory camp. That doesn't mean that the two choices are believe that one person firing, I don't know, one bullet from one place was the only person who ever had anything to do with the JFK assassination case closed, or believe Oliver Stone's, you know, uh, uh, version of events. There are other explanations that I think do not fall, that are radical, that are part of our anarchist and broader radical uh, uh, heritage, but that do not fall into the, the sort of logical categories that I was trying to... Maybe I'm, getting, maybe I'm taking a definitional approach to the problem in their void of, I don't know, maybe I'm avoiding the real problem. I'm not sure. I, I, to address your non I think I don't want to get all Popperian uh, about this and start talking about verifiability and conditions of verification and such, but, but the fact is that if, if I got Hillary Clinton into bed and she was green and scaly, <laughs> I would agree with Mr. Ricky. But if he, got, if, if he got her into bed and she, you know, wasn't green and scaly, he would find a way of explaining why either he was hypnotized into not seeing her scales or she had caught with a technology to disguise her skin. I think it's the fundamental thing about most conspiracy theories is that there's an ex explanation for everything. You can never get disconfirming evidence. That's the elasticity of the idea. But that's, sorry, that's a problem with all this lumping in. Like what you were saying too is, is it yeah. automatically, he mentions Gulf of Tonkin, we suddenly get to Oliver Stone's film. 
right? It's like, but he just gave a good historical example where at the time, concretely, people on the left were saying that's a conspiracy theory. And we avoid, let's talk about 9-11, and instead we say you're anti-Semitic and there's black ops. And so immediately, like this dismissive thing, which is the thing I was trying to point out to you, it's at play in this room all the time. The Reichstag fire example is not addressed, but I can talk about anti-Semitic versions and by lumping it all together it just it silences stuff so i think you you brought up the point about i look at 9 11 and i say wow there's a lot of things that got dropped really suspiciously in this and there's pages and pages of people who have written out all this stuff but we, we can't talk about it and i'm not saying it's necessarily right but it is not allowed to be talked about here in canada wherever that because it's a conspiracy theory even though people have said look at let's look at the interests let's do this analysis my information is incorrect but let's try and prove this and what albert or other people do is they pick out a wacky version of it and say look at this guy he thinks that there was a ballerina there and isn't it all ridiculous instead of saying well look at look at these people and i mean the internet is full of it and and so all i'm all i'm trying to say is let's not just slam that gopher down immediately can't we look at it in terms of verifiable theory recognizing like the gulf of tonkin is we don't have all the facts and we won't be able to but if we look factually and disconfirm or confirm let's deal with those facts and if we want to spend a whole panel talking about 9 11 let's go on the internet and pull out this stuff and start saying we'll disconfirm this fact but because you construct this thing as conspiracy theory is right wing left wing it's all together for me to be a conspiracy theorist means that I hate Jews and that I get really uncomfortable with saying just because I want to investigate 9-11, I have to carry this baggage. And your theoretical framework doesn't let me get out of this baggage, right? And I, I, I'm not anti Semitic. So, anyway, I've talked too much. Well, and, and I think that's, I mean, I think that's part of this question is it's like, how do we, how are we able to distinguish between ideas that seem to be really incredibly outlandish and ideas that may somewhere track somewhere similar to that but are done with good scholarship because there certainly were people in the 1970s who were talking about Tonkin Golf in very clear and well thought out ways and, and the question is, is how are we able to figure out who's, who is doing quality research and who is putting together ideas in good ways so that we can get to this place of okay this is, this is where my, my ideas about the world are challenged and this is where I can accept things and not and, and not be in the straw person argument about the aliens you know being the ones who are pulling the strings but rather okay yes there are some very real indications that you know maybe there was more going on in particular event A than what we conventionally believe and we don't need to dismiss all theories about event A as conspiracy theory, but rather say this particular piece of information is important and you know, over the course of scholarship and research and history, we will understand more about it. But to say right now that 9-11 was, you know, the result of, you know, whether it's Rumsfeld or it's Saudi Arabia or whatever, it doesn't seem to me that, at least I haven't seen good scholarship around that which suggests the kind of level of information that we would need to be able to say this is where the causality comes from or this is where the story suddenly turns in a different direction than what we understand it to be. And we, what we, I, I think what people on the left need is how do we differentiate between you know, the good Tonkin Gulf research and the bad Tonkin Gulf research? And that's, I think that's the direction that we need to go because there obviously are going to be events where the government is doing things that are clearly, you know, I don't know, conspiratorial, I guess. I mean, the, the illegal, uh, immoral, any kind of, I mean, lots of different adjectives we can toss at it. But it's how do we differentiate those from the aliens? And it's the, and it's the straw person arguments that we probably need to get away from. I don't think a term like conspiracy theory is going to help you make that distinction, help anybody make that distinction, because it's going to be too big, it's going to, be, uh, it's going to exclude a lot of things that should be in there, it's going to include a lot of things that wouldn't be in there. And so, um, and, and, but there, at this point, there are no guidelines, right? And so and people are trying to work those out. So the question is, do we, do we work on those kinds of, uh, uh, of, of filters that we want to say, okay, well, if aliens come into the picture, no way. Jews come into the picture, no way, right? And then, or is it, is it that we're looking for particular answers in any of these, or are we looking for new ways of asking the questions um, and saying, well, okay, even though they end up here, well, what about all this stuff, how they got there? Can we plug those things out, rework them, turn them into our, our own narratives? I just want to make a comment. I mean, for one, it's a little upsetting to me that there's no women participating hardly at all in this conversation. 
I'm wondering in terms of legitimacy of when something moves from being a theory to being truth, whether that's simply because all of the facts are ascertained or whether there is an outside body, whether it's the media or the government, that makes it truth. And I think that that's a real problem for us, not only that we don't have a body of people that are committed to actually researching the ridiculous theories and the theories that seem more credible and actually able to have open dialogue and have some sort of, some sort of a hearing of some sort, looking at the, the truth and the potential of some of these theories and um, rather than just sort of relying on media. And because I also think when you rely on media, you've got people looking at sort of the more sensational pieces, as someone was saying, rather than looking at some of the more, you know, staid and steady theories. Um, so I think that, I mean, I agree with Arthur, we have to figure out a way to really research these um, ideas in a way that's responsible and that doesn't necessarily look to the rest of society to necessarily be in agreement with the work that the project that we're engaged in. Hopefully, I think by having some sort of ability to come up with some consensus within a radical community, then you've got sort of more power to bring it toward, to a more mainstream audience. But I certainly don't think we want to be waiting for the idea of truth to be coming, to be sort of given the stamp of approval by people that we know don't have interest in actually hearing that truth unless it's absolutely, you know, requires that they accept it because there's, there's no way that they can get a squirm out of it. Should we do one more contribution and then um, I also agree with you. I wish there were more women participating. But um, the, other, the other thing that I'm, I'm hearing everybody say, you're talking about theory, 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 but what it really sounds like you're talking about is bad history. I mean, just by, labeling a, a, just by labeling a version of events a theory, immediately it gets into the realm of the subjective, and immediately we start discounting anything that that theory has to say, where if I was to say, this is a history of the JFK assassination, it immediately provides a much greater deal of credibility to that version of events. And so our lack of credible histories on, you know, on, on, or credible, radi credible radical histories of events in, in the world is, is less not having a theory to write them by, but more lacking the critical thinking skills and knowing how to do adequate research and knowing how to, and if you want to look at, I mean, school systems in the United States and how we teach history and how we teach critical thinking, you know, we don't teach primary document-based history. We don't teach people how to look back and use the puzzle pieces that they're given and how to develop, how to develop theories of, of events based on that stuff. And that's a huge problem because as soon as you get into talking about stuff with theory, it's immediately discredited. So what we're really talking about is incomplete histories, histories that are written without all of the facts that are needed. In the 1970s, they couldn't write an adequate history of the Gulf of Tonkin because we weren't given the material that one would need to write a history by. And, and so that's kind of what I hear everybody talking about, but calling it by a much different name. And when we start talking about theory, it gets way up here, as opposed to being, you know, history is made of the, it's, you know, it's looking in archives and, and excavating what truths we can find based on the documents and the, the tangible items and things that we have available to us. Uh, yes, please. But even, even you know, replacing the term history is, is, uh, is problematic because, I mean, you know, so many uh, things have been talked about in the 90s about revisionist history and about any attempt to, you know, insert, uh, you know, women or minorities or any kind of history that was untold for centuries back into, you know, the history that we'd all been taught was called revisionist history. So I think it's just, you have to, you know, in the same way that you have to... Uh, critically look at uh, conspiracy theories and, and critically look at history. Um, I think what, what's true of both of there is that the right and, and, the, and the norm and those in power will always be trying to discredit um, a voice that's questioning the power. And um, so, you know, even, even calling it history doesn't suffice for suddenly gaining it respect. Um, within like the white tower of academia, if I call myself a historian, I will have many more resources at my call than if I call myself 
a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> I'm, I'm reluctant to taper this off, but we are um, well over our allotted time. Do, do folks feel comfortable? The, the room is not needed right now. If you don't mind missing lunch or whatever, do you want to just hang out still? <laughs> What's lunch? Uh, 12, 15 to 1? I don't know. What, what time is lunch? <laughs> <laughs> Thank, thanks very much. This has been a recording of Peter Staudenmeyer describing The Anarchism of Fools, Conspiracy Theory as a Substitute for Social Critique. He spoke at the 2004 Renewing the Anarchist Tradition Conference at Goddard College in Plainfield, Vermont, on September 26, 2004. Thanks for listening.